The single most important thing we need today is people who emit carbon need to get charged for it, irrespective of where they are and what they're doing. But today, there is no charge for carbon. And unless that changes, we are never going to be able to make substantial progress. And the reason we can't have a price for carbon is because nobody knows how much carbon actually is consumed in making a specific product in a specific geography. And getting that information is going to take years and years and years of effort. And today, there is no global body that is even thinking about doing something like that. There is a side of the coin that is regulation, that is commitment, that is moral reality, but there is the other side of the coin which I call and risk, which I call opportunity and innovation and possibility. And how do we create that? I think is to look again at the local level and, and, and mobilize whole of government, whole of society in reality, in the material reality, not in the abstract reality of declarations uh, that we do at COPS, not in the abstract reality of the markets, not in the abstract reality um, of the finance system, in the material and concrete reality. And I think we can make a very material change, a very real change. There is no way a company like IKEA can exist in the future if we would be reckless about nature or materials or climate. And it's very simple, you know, except for the ethical reasons, except for the brand reasons, which each one of them I believe is big enough, is that the economic model doesn't uh, doesn't allow depletion of, of uh, resources. The inter interactions that are there between land degradation and our own health, the interactions that are there between land degradation and migration, forced migration, the interactions that are there between um, land degradation and conflicts, when people fight for access to fertile land and water all over the world, then it becomes much more complex as, as it is. So it requires diplomacy, it requires political engagement, it requires policies at the national and at the regional level, and it requires the, that farmers, um, women's group, youth, indigenous peoples, all come together with governments to actually discuss these issues that are critically important.
we're seeing interest rates starting to reduce and that should ease up some of the pressure, allow more activity, help labor markets, job creation and so on. So that's, I think, a positive um, for the world. It remains, though. It's still a very volatile situation. It's hard to overstate the amount of volatility, the amount of uncertainty, the amount of difficulty that everyone has been facing, particularly since COVID, but even going back years before that. It's difficult to say we're out of the woods. We'll always have that element of caution, I think, but there are some, there are some encouraging signs. There are 3.3 billion people who are living in countries that spend as much on debt servicing as on health or education. So it's really seeing quite direct impact on core areas of societal function. In the wake of the pandemic, there was a, a lot of spending had to happen to cushion economies, to cushion societies from what was going on and that pushed debt levels up. Simultaneously, interest rates were very high, so you now have a lot of countries facing this horrible situation of high debt levels and interest payments on those debts that are that are um, quite difficult to manage. This situation can be much more serious for developing uh, economies that would have fewer resources with which to, to cushion um, these impacts. And we have seen some countries where servicing costs have, have really skyrocketed, taking up more than half of the overall government uh, revenue. So really serious situation. Definitely advanced economies are, are also seeing this fiscal squeeze. I think the, the stakes are a bit lower. Um, again, almost by definition, these advanced economies, they're richer, they have more resources to, to put in the blow. Um, but we're seeing it in the politics all around us. The demand for public spending, for investment in basic infrastructure, that's not just a development becoming thing, that's becoming an increasingly pressing need across um, all of the world. Chief economists have repeatedly warned uh, about how sluggish the outlook for global growth is. But something they looked at this year was not just the quantity of growth that we need, but also the, the quality or the character of growth that we need. And I think facing it to challenges such as climate change, obviously, um, resilience in the face of, of the pandemic, I think there's a, a general consensus that we need to think about growth differently. edition of the Chief Economist Outlook is drawing attention to is the need for a, a wider sense of economic policy that includes GDP growth be, because it remains really important, but also the other, the other policy goals such as equality or sustainability or resilience. These things are equally important and it's a real challenge for policymakers. One of the things we try to do with the Chief Economist Outlook is take what can be very abstract technical trends in the global economy and really bring it home in a concrete sense for a very wide audience. continue as we uh, are the path we're following today, we're likely to, to breach the seventh boundary within the next few years. So this is, this is really not only dire information in terms of the resilience of the whole Earth system being at risk, it is uh, very worrying that we continue to move in the wrong direction. We haven't started to really bend the curves on, on any of these boundaries yet.
would argue one of the most important uh, advancements over the past decades is our understanding that our planet is a complex self-regulating biogeophysical system where all the boundaries interact and determine in the end the final state of the climate system, state of our ecosystems and state of the livability um, and habitability for humans and all other species on Earth. Even if we phase out oil, coal and gas and, and successfully carry out the energy transition towards a fossil fuel free world economy by 2050, which would be exactly along the line that science advises us to follow, you would still crash through the 1.5 degrees Celsius boundary if we do not come into the safe space on biodiversity. Because the biodiversity holds the resilience of the entire living biosphere, both in the ocean and on land. Does that mean that uh, the planet is collapsing? No, it means that the planet is at high risk of causing irreversible changes in the functioning of the ocean system, of the ice sheet systems, of big biomes like the Amazon rainforest, which can cause permanent drift away from the basis upon which we all, or, or the stability of the Earth system upon which we all depend on. The final piece of this is to show the solutions, that solving the climate boundary is no longer fantasy or utopia. We, we, we know how to do it, technologies are available and they are scalable. It's a, it's a question of acceleration. We have multiple boundaries that all end up in the ocean. So the ocean is, a, is in a way the end station victim of so much of our waste, of our eutrophication, of our heat, and of the carbon dioxide. And that has to be turned around because the ocean is what in the end will determine whether or not we have a livable planet for humanity. Mm -hmm.